Good evening, folks. Um, it's 5.30. I'm going to open the uh, public hearing in regards to the proposed changes to the zoning bylaws. And uh, we have a couple of individuals in the audience. Todd's here, our zoning administrator, and uh, Etienne, who's the chair of the Planning Commission, Planning Council. So the way we have a, we have a, a choice here, um, we can either go through each of the uh, proposed changes line by line, but I'll remind the board we've already done that, we've gone through them, or we can simply ask questions of Todd and Etienne at this point. So um, kind of looking to the board to wonder what you might want to do. Would you like to go through line by line or would you like to ask questions? And then what I'll do is I'll give the, uh, the board a chance to ask questions and we'll give the public a chance to ask questions as well. I would defer to what the audience, what the preference of the audience is. Others? I think that's fine. Whatever the audience wants to do with, um, I mean, we've already had a presentation. We've had the opportunity to ask some questions. I don't know if developed any more, but um, I think this is a public hearing to hear from the public. Okay. And just to be clear, this is the first of two public hearings as well. Would you like to come up to the microphone? Introduce yourself as usual. James Brewster, and this is a procedural question. Um, normally, it's my understanding at a public hearing, public hearing are one-way comments from us, the public, to you, not an opportunity <coughs> for us to get into a discussion with you or for you folks to answer questions. Cool. So I'm trying to understand because I think we have, as a public and as a legislative body, gotten into trouble historically where these public forums, or excuse me, these public hearings have gone back and forth and back and forth. So right. I'm trying to understand if this is an opportunity to ask questions or merely come up and say, I agree with this, I don't agree with this, thank you very much and sit down. I think either of those would be would be fine. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's not a discussion between the board and the public, but rather it's a chance for the board to get to gain some public input. And I could I can imagine a situation where it could be a question. I can imagine a situation where it's simply a statement. And we've yeah. got people here from the Planning Council and Todd's here to answer questions. So. Correct. Come on up to the microphone. Yeah, Bob Wartree. Uh, I'd like to sort of have an overview of all of this. Uh, I've not absorbed everything that's in this proposal of changes, so it would be really, at least for me, extraordinarily helpful to really understand the, the uh, nuts and bolts of, of what this means, um, if, if that's a help okay. to anyone. Todd, are you okay to give an overview? Shall I? Sure. Yeah, come on up. Uh, one thing to note, you only have one public hearing scheduled. You have two meetings, probably just to clarify. Correct, yeah. hearing tonight, which you may or may not close at the end of the meeting, and you have a vote on this scheduled for July 1st, which you may or may not take. But it's like only have one hearing scheduled. Correct, so at this point. But there will be another hearing. No, there'll be another meeting, so, not a hearing. Yeah, another, yeah. Yes, okay. Just distinction with the difference. Right, okay. yeah. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, many of you have heard this before, there are a few faces in the room, so I'll try to take it as slowly as possible. Uh, so the public hearing warning you have on the, in your agenda is pretty much everything here. There's some stuff that's minor. There's a few things here that are more major. I'm happy to go through them. I'm just, I usually go through these one by one, and if any questions, just stop, say hey Todd, or raise your hand, however you want to handle it. Happy to respond to your, all you guys, and any questions, I'm happy to help. So, uh, on the hearing notice, it starts with section 201.1. Uh, this is really simple. Uh, it's actually 472 as well. We're uh, consolidating some zones due to the larger S100 Homes Act. And to back up on that, the legislature uh, last year passed a, uh, a preemption of local zoning control in order to help facilitate construction of new homes to ease Vermont's housing crunch. And so we as a town are dealt with uh, the hand of trying to matching what the state requires us to do while trying to still try to fit it within local concerns and local interests and local desires. And I think the planning council and I have done a pretty good job with that thus far. Um, but you're all the judge of that, I guess. So uh, section 201, we're just eliminating a couple zones in terms of uh, streamlining things for the larger zoning change. Uh, section 201.3, 
It's more so, of a housekeeping item. But so before Todd goes on, I just want to say if there are questions about any particular sections that he's that he is referring to, Zoom as we go, yeah, yes. Please, yes, please come up and comment on them. Yes, we will not that be that going back afterwards to kind of review them. So, uh, hearing no questions on 201.1, I'm going to 201.3. This is more of a housekeeping item. Uh, if you're, let's say you own 50 acres in a, in a zoning boundary to split your property, the Development Review Board has the option to approve either zone right now. Uh, the source service management area, which dictates where the village can bring sort to, is treated as a zone. And it's not clear in the zoning that the DRB can deal with split SSMA distinctions, and we're clarifying they can. So we're saying the SSMA is a zone just like other zones, and we're saying that if there's a property, if you have an acre of property or 50 acres of property split by the source service management area, that the DRB can make a determination on it, just like we can a regular zone. Any questions on that one? That's an easy one. Uh, next one, section 204.4, and we'll talk about this in a bit as well. Uh, with the Homes Act came a requirement that single family zoning is now illegal. A town can't say this is a single family only zone. Any one with a lot can put two houses everywhere. The Planning Council has worked very hard in recent years to try to direct new density and development into the village, into areas of existing water and sewer roads, and away from areas like Sterling Valley or Mud City Loop or Elmore Mountain Road where there aren't those services and where uh, there's more, where we try to be more conservation minded. So by the state in effect with S100, the Homes Act, doubling the density for these areas, the Planning Council wanted to make a larger lot size, which we'll get about in one second. I know there's some comments on that. And part of the compromise language of going from our two builders acres minimum right now to where they voted at three was, uh, and originally it was a four acre proposal, but they clarified in section 204.4 that they're no longer gonna allow waivers of minimum lot size. So that's one of the compromises of going to a larger lot size and it wasn't as large as some members of the planning council wanted. The compromise is your minimum lot size, your lot size, if you're 10 feet short, 100 square feet short, if you're 1,000 square feet short, there's no, no waivers anymore. You either, it, is, it is or it isn't. You either make the minimum or you don't. So that's part of the proposal tonight. We'll go into the larger lot sizes. We're not allowing waivers of existing lots anymore. If you don't have the three acres or the select board says two acres, you don't have it. Um, any questions on that, the waiver? So no more waivers of lot size. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. step up to the microphone, Does, please. Yeah, Bob Fortry again. Does this, um, does this encompass the rural and agricultural zone? Everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere in town, no more lot size waivers. So, with that being said, what this tells me is that if someone has 10 acres, they can put three lots on it. Correct? Correct. We haven't gotten to the lot size part yet. It's just the waiver part, but yes, I agree with you. Okay. And so, the way it had been zoned before was those 10 acres would be two acre lots and each two acres for each of those lots would be put into um, conservation. Does, does this change that? No, you're really talking about section 204.5. We'll get there in a second. This uh, section 204.4 is just basically saying a lot size has a stated requirement. So we're not going to waive that requirement anymore. Any waiver, any waiver, waiver can be given by the DRB for any dimension requirement up to 25%. So. Uh, if the lot size needs to be X, the DRB can say you can be 25% less. If your setback needs to be X, the DRB can say it's 25% less. We're actually excluding lot sizes from waivers with this provision under section 204.4, that's all. We'll get to the larger lot size in a second. I want to okay. play the two issues. All right, so we're just saying no more lot size waivers is what this does. Any other questions on that? Okay, so section 204.5, uh, we're adding a waiver language to encourage affordable housing so it complies with the Home Act. The, one of the home, things the Home Act does requires a 40% waiver for any affordable housing development. So any affordable housing development can be uh, not meet your zoning by 40% and that's the new law. So we're basically beating the language of the new law with that. So that one's pretty straightforward. Any questions on that one? Okay. And the Homes Act is the infamous S100? S100 is the Homes Act, yes. I'll use them both synonymously, but the Homes Act is 
HOME stands for Housing Opportunities uh, Made for Everyone. It's the HOMES Act. All right, so this is the uh, this is the um, one of the one of the big ones here. Section two hundred four point five a, editing the use table. So one of the first things we're doing here is eliminating uh, not eliminating reducing building heights townwide by one story. One of the things that the Homes Act does, which you talked about before with the select board, is it allows affordable housing project to go one story taller than your maximum height requirement. The maximum height requirement in this town is basically measured by our ladder truck. If you don't want to buy a new $1.9 million ladder truck, you have to limit your heights by one story. Otherwise, a property could force you to buy a new ladder truck. A project could force you to buy a new ladder truck. So everyone is dealing with one story less of uh, maximum height to account for. We could get a project that's affordable that comes in one story taller. That means we can still serve it and provide life safety with our existing ladder truck. Any questions on that one? Is this restricted to all buildings Everywhere. or just affordable? We can't do it just affordable. Everywhere, everyone's getting it. Every zone in town is getting a one-story haircut to account for the possibility of affordable housing projects somewhere that could be a story taller than our okay. ladder truck and serve. Yeah. So essentially, it stays the same. You're just not increasing it. Correct, but we it is decreased for for me and you. We're not affordable housing developers or owners. We own regular house. If you wanted to build a, a taller house, you couldn't buy ten feet now. Right. So we are all getting a haircut to account for the possibility that someone could come in as an affordable project with a larger project to make sure our existing fire apparatus can serve it. All right, so uh, building height size, accessory on-farm businesses, that's a new state law from a couple years ago we're adding in for the first time. And this is the section that Bob was talking about that I know Julia wants to talk about. Uh, section 204.5B, we have two things here, the, the density changes. One, in order to comply with the Homes Act, we're instituting a maximum village lot size. So the maximum lot size in the village is 8,000 square feet. Minimum is 4,000 square feet. So if you're connected to village water and sewer, you're building on two tenths of an acre going forward. And that's how we're complying with the state mandated five houses per acre requirement. The other part of this, which isn't required, this is again, the planning council trying to direct development into the village where there's, where there's paved roads, water, sewer, is they're looking to increase the minimum lot size in the rural areas from 40, from 80,000 square feet, which is two builders acres to 120,000 square feet, which is three builders acres. So that is one of the big changes. I think there are a lot of people here to talk about tonight. Any, any comments? I'll remind the, the audience that if you do have a comment on one of these sections to please comment while we're talking about it, don't wait till the end because they'll be closed. Um, my name is Julia Campania, uh, Golf Course Road, Morristown. I completely agree with the Planning Commission's premise and the Affordable Housing Act that density belongs in the village. It's sound planning. You have your water sewer infrastructure here. When our community built out in the early 1800s, you saw density elbow to elbow because it was smart planning. It was economies of scale for the public infrastructure. So it totally makes sense to do that. However, it's a complete contradiction to affordability of housing to increase density requirements in the outlying rural, rag, rural residential ag area because it just drives the cost and raises the barrier for home ownership. And I'll give an example because I know everybody wants to say, oh, is this really a problem? It is really a problem. I have a bachelor's degree son, graduated from college, has a great job. He could not afford to touch a piece of land in a 50 mile radius of here to buy a home, start a home, build a home. He's now in a tiny house in our pasture connected to our water and sewer because that's all he can afford. There's nothing affordable for the first time home buyers, the starting out homeowners. And on the other end of the spectrum, the retirees who have 10 acres now and have the ability to carve off two acres every couple of years and sell off some land and supplement their retirement income are now being diminished in, in their net worth. Essentially, you're taking away their ability um, to further um, you know, use their capital in their land to subsidize their retirement income. So, um, the the idea of the act being you know the mission of affordability 
is contradicted by an increase in any lot size anywhere, unless it's a conservation effort for conserving, preserving lands, you're just creating a barrier to home ownership and affordability of home ownership. So please, please, please don't do this. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Good evening, Grant Wheeler, Fairwood Parkway. Um, first off, I want to express, uh, you know, respect for the planning council. There's a lot of really great work uh, in all these changes um, and having not been the person, you know, donating their time on a weekly basis, I respect that, that work and I, and I appreciate it. Um, so I do support the majority of these changes, um, but <laughs> for our comment period today, I would like to echo Julia's uh, aforementioned sentiments. First off, uh, this reactionary change, um, you know, is the antithesis of the intent of the Holmes Act. So there's first and foremost, it's reactionary and being reactionary is not necessarily how we should be guiding our priorities. Um, secondly, it does uh, change the game. Um, you know, our 1.82 acre, two builder acre minimum has been in place, um, actually maybe perhaps ever since zoning bylaws uh, came in place in this town. So a good, you know, many decades. So uh, you're changing the rules of the game, which is going to adversely, potentially, um, and significantly adversely impact our taxpayers today, a lot of which who may have estate plans tied up in the future use of their land. So this could dramatically alter their uh, financial futures. Um, and I think that first and foremost, our, you know, your fiduciary would be to the taxpayer. Um, finally, uh, if, if this policy is an attempt to reduce density, I mean, first and foremost, I do not want to see more of our hillsides fragmented. Um, so if the intent of this policy is to uh, secure, um, you know, our natural resources moving forward, I think there are better mechanisms that we could utilize, um, you know, to, to attain that act. Um, thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah, again, I, I guess introduce I don't yourself fully again, Bob. Bob Worker. Thank, thank you. Again. I guess I don't fully understand. We're in the rural agricultural zone now, correct? Is that where we are? Yes. Right. Uh, the way it has been zoned is that for every two acres, buildable acres, two acres have to be set aside in conservation. Am I, am I correct on that? Different. Um, no different. Todd, Todd is that correct? It's just the, uh, there's no conservation. There is a conservation subdivision allowance. If you want to talk about that, you may be mixing that up. But in order to build in town, you need 80,000 square feet, two mobile acres. There's no conservation part. I mean, you can buy a two acre so lot, but they're kind of the conservation of part was then put in place to try and basically conserve land from being over. Yes, we have, um, if you're doing a major subdivision in town right now, you have to go through the conservation subdivision process, which instead of requiring what was two acre lots allows one acre lots provided half of the subject site is permanently protected in terms of uh, conservation easement, deed restriction, transfer to land trust, transfer to the town. We've been very successful that we've, we've conserved, I think six or seven different properties that way. So that's the one acre, uh, the one acre smaller lot size when you have 100 acres instead of 52 acre lots, it's 51 acre lots, and it's 50 acres of permanent effect. Right? Okay. I guess what you're talking about. It is. Um, so does the does the this three acre um, lot increase? Does that have anything to do with the conservation zone? In other words, if you develop three acres as in a conservation mode, those three acres have to be preserved. It would be the same ratio. So if the, if the new three acre builder's acre lot size were to survive the select board of trustee votes, it's now instead of uh, building on, if you're doing conservation subject, it's acre and a half lots. For, for every acre and a half lot, you have an acre and a half of permanent protected open space. So okay. basically it's just a 50% higher. Okay. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you. Judy Bickford, I would just like to uh, agree with uh, Grant and Julia that I feel that the increasing the lot size to three acres outside in the town is going to be a hardship and it's going to be a them and us situation where we're going to have more low income housing in the village. And um, 
more expensive housing outside. I don't want to see us become um, more stow like Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on to another section? Okay, Todd, it's all yours. Okay. Moving on, thank you for all those comments. So we're on to section 206. Uh, that's what the says. So this is design criteria. One of the ways the, uh, the council is trying to make sure new development comports with the surrounding neighborhood and the surrounding developments and surrounding homes is to regulate it a little more. And the big catch here in section 206.1 and 0.2 and 0.3, the really big thing is there's two really parts of it that as part of the Homes Act, the regulation of section 206 is being done on single family homes for the first time in certain parts of the town, not out in the rural areas, but in the core of the village, uh, normally it was just duplexes and multifamilies and commercial that fall, fell under section 206. With this new zoning change, it actually makes single family homes in the village fall under section 206. So that's one of the big catches. So that's one of the big uh, catch there. The other part of section 206, uh, the main part on section 206 is industrial zone number four, which is the old Green Mountain Arena. It's eliminating that area from the design criteria. That area is well protected by trees. It's got a conservation band around it. Uh, it's really duplicative having it there. So. Uh, in, my, in my view, it is a change in my view that's more housekeeping than anything else because those protections aren't really needed for that one parcel of town, which is uh, on the zone map right over here. So it it eliminates industrial zone number four? It doesn't eliminate, it eliminates the protections all that. Okay. It just eliminates section 206 there. There's not much you can do with that. And then so the peninsula is mostly protected. And what's on the other side there is, is pretty hard to develop. There's three plateaus, there's deep ravines, there's the Ryder Brook. I just, um, so that's the main changes there. So breaking into section, any questions on that? Before we go on to one, one, two, yes. Yeah, I'm just waiting. Garage question, come on up, yes. Garage. I, 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 I'm in pre warning concern, so I know who you are. This, this is under 206? Under 206, yes. Okay. So yeah, I am here because I- Could you introduce I, yourself? My name is Tracy Durosher. I live Thank you, Tracy. on Elmore Street. Um, I purchased a small home there uh, with a large lot. Most of my land is in the front of my house. I have very little behind me. It goes into sort of a, a gully ditch. Um, and when I purchased the home, I was told it was permittable to put a garage up when I was ready. I came in to get the garage permit and was told that I have to now have it set back from the front of my house by five feet which is a cliff for me. So I have land, but I am not allowed to utilize the land, but I can also go out and purchase a lesser than building a shed temporary 10 by 20 and put it anywhere I want, but I can't put a beautiful 12 by 26 garage in. So I'm asking for maybe some uh, consideration about how that property on that line a lot of people don't have anything behind their home it is to the side or in the front um yeah i'm also right across the street where somebody's taking a small piece of land and putting five or six buildings on it for people to purchase and i'm not allowed to put a garage to store my car and extras that's all i have thank you so my question, Todd, is is her concern the existing bylaws or these proposed bylaws? Uh, it's actually a little bit of both, to give you a fun answer. The garage language exists now and existed since, since uh, prior years. However, because of the H100 changes being applied to single family for the first time. So I unfortunately had to deny Mr. Roche's garage last week because the garage is required to be set back at least five feet from the front facade of a house. The only place she really has to build is her front yard because her house is set back on the edge of the Potash Brook. A little bit of nice lot of So, um, uh, as a solution we talked about, I mean, she could go to the DRV and seek a variance. Variances are hard to get, statutorily in Vermont. Or uh, one of the things we talked about is, uh, and there are planning council members here who can talk about it, is maybe regulating attached garages differently than detached garages. The two issues I've had with garage in the last couple of weeks have been detached garages kind of far away from the home, and maybe the intent is more to 
regulate the attached garage to make sure the home is primary and not the garage? I don't have an answer to that. I don't want to speak to my board members. So I'm not sure that's a good solution or not, but it's a solution that can be my head. So unless the these regulations, these proposed regulations are amended further, it's not going to solve her problem. Uh, it doesn't solve her problem unless you just say it's just attached garages and you eliminate yeah. detached garages. But it says attached and detached right now. Okay, thank you. you any any other, other garage questions? Any other comments on 206? Yeah. So, okay. uh, Tyler Romley, uh, property owner, local engineer. Um, talk, can you talk about the stormwater? What, what that means? Uh, and I'm asking because it just says shall not um, send it into the public right away, but there's a lot of situations where you're going to have um, downtown properties that have no other alternative or there is an existing discharge to the public right away. So I'm just wondering what, what, uh, so it's one sentence that has like a, the word shall in there, which is two, kind of scary. Two. So I'm just wondering what the leniency is. I had um, one planning council member was unfortunately not here tonight that was really, uh, really wanted this to move forward. It's direct discharges. We're not talking about sheet flow coming on a driveway onto a town road. You're talking about something like a pipe or a gutter coming onto a town road or town property. Anything that's pre existing is pre existing. It's grandfathered. We're talking about future things. Uh, really, this came up with a uh, property that had a uh, draining directly onto a sidewalk in town and the road crew was sanding and salting every day. And so we're trying to get a little, he's trying to offer a little bit of control here to make sure that if you're doing a direct discharge for sidewalks, the gutter has since been moved, the gutter was going out there, and now the gutter's going back away from the road to so solve the problem. But he's trying to make sure that problem doesn't just again hit you with a direct discharge, so pipe, the gutter, something like that, something that's conveying water directly, not something coming down a road or something coming off to the building. A key where there's onto, like surface. Yes, surface, yep. The help? Yes. <laughs> Other questions, comments about 206? Okay, Todd, 207. Okay, so well, 206.1, 206.2 like quickly is uh, we're doing commercial size building maximums. This is a key point for the first time. Uh, using, picking on a project that Tyler worked on since he's in the room. Uh, the Jersey Heights development, the, uh, the new apartment buildings back there, they're much larger than the host neighborhood. So what this 206.2 would do is, uh, is make sure that the buildings are no longer than 68 feet wide and no more than 150% deep of the adjacent buildings, the primary buildings. So the planning council by this is trying to control the scale of new development to make sure it fits in the neighborhood so it doesn't overpower the surrounding homes. So that's the first time we've done this. So that's something worth noting on here. Any, unless there's any questions on that, I'm going to 206.3. So just to clarify, 206, uh, Tyler's question was about 206.2, correct? The storm stormwater correct. discharge? Okay. Okay. 206.3? 206.3 is we're allowing a new type of development, cottage court development. Uh, so you're talking about allowing where normally it's a single family use uh, in the village or allowing a cluster of small cottages, think 800 square feet or less, one and a half stories or less around a common green. I kind of think it was like Melrose Place for those remember the show way back in the day, <laughs> but like a small cottage style. That's the best analogy I can give you. you Very know. California. Yes. Yeah. It's a great way to, uh, it's a great way to provide smaller scale housing, more affordable housing in a form and a single family neighborhood is going to accept. That's the important part. So that's the reason we're allowing that for the first time. And it's, it's allowed only via DRB conditional use approval. So many neighborhoods are going to get this. The neighbors have plenty of opportunity to come in front of the DRB and have their say in the quality judicial process. Any questions on cottage court developments? Uh, um, I, think, I think this cottage court development is uh, yeah, just a great example. I, Daniel, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. Grant Wheeler Fairwood Parkway. Um, cottage court style development is, uh, is a great example of a smart development initiative and infill development, um, you know, which I'm obviously all in favor for. But uh, a side comment, because a lot of people ask me, they see, you know, this is sort of almost being piloted <laughs> around our town and village already, asking me, um, 
you know, if this is something that the market will bear. And what's interesting is the Lamoille County Planning Commission in collaboration with the Lamoille Housing Partnership and the Lamoille Area Board of Realtors um, just published a really significant study um, of Lamoille County and Hardwick in, in our housing stock. And within that study is contained some really significant and like nitty gritty details on our demographics and demographic information that we are analyzing to help help us make informed legislative decisions moving forward about this exact type of development. And the, the long and short 30,000 foot level uh, in, in looking through this resource is that there is a very quickly growing market for something like this. So um, before people write this off as something that will never happen, I would say there, there is a place for this. And, uh, and I think it's a great example of um, the planning council taking an initiative and putting forward something thoughtful uh, to create a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. 207. Thanks, Grant. I was like positive comments. I appreciate that. Section 207 and section, the next three, three or four are really just small clarifications of housekeeping. For example, 207E is just saying, uh, clarifying where the front setbacks measure from when a sidewalk is not present, that situation does, uh, uh, does arise. Uh, the next two are just simple uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, the clarifying section 422, that the ZA, uh, it's a clarification permit no more than two dwellings off a shared driveway, not just a private driveway. There are more language qualifications. The next really significant thing is there is in section 422B. So Todd, let me just interject. Are there any questions, comments on 207E, 401, 4053, 422? Go ahead. So section uh, 422B allows the DRB to create uh, 30 foot right of ways. We currently require 30 feet, 50 feet everywhere instead of 30. This will allow for smaller compact developments in a village setting. And there's a condition on here. We have large equipment. We want large room, public room to work. These are private roads only. So uh, if you look at a, at a neighborhood, especially a village neighborhood, a lot of the developer real estate for housing is taken up by road right of way. Most of those roads in a village setting aren't that large, so this allows smaller road roadways, which allows for more housing. And these are private roads. These aren't roads we'll deal with. This is developers have to deal with these roads. I think it's actually an impactful change and hopefully it gets taken advantage of. And I agree with Grant, by the way. I am, we are going to see cottage court developments here. I'm going to applications and these only bylaws are done for those. I guarantee it. Uh, section 423. 422B, comments? Yeah. Todd, we have a comment? Is this in the village only? Uh, no, it's not in the village only. So this is uh, village and county? Yes. Will this affect current right of ways? No, zoning is always forward looking. Okay. Zoning never goes backwards. Okay. Uh, that's what the terms your grandfather would know. It's grandfather, but it's, it's zoning is always forward looking only. So it's new developments only. It doesn't impact anything that already exists. For anything that doesn't even exist yet, if it has its permit, it's already grandfathered. Uh, section 423, we're making various Homes Act changes to protected uses. There's, there's a lot of, it's, the state has a lot of things that says we can or cannot do or can do limited things, like accessory apartment is one of those, and they change the rules and the definition of accessory apartment. That's one of the things that's in here. It's, this is more housekeeping in terms of the Homes Act. Section 451, anything on 423? Yeah. Thank you, Todd. Section 451, everyone just, everyone just speak out. <laughs> Uh, section 451, this allows the select board, a new zoning rule, to work with the developers to create new public, public off-street parking uh, that counts towards minimum parking requirements. So let's say that a developer came to the select board and said, hey, I've got this parking lot, and I think it makes sense to use this as, as parking for overnight for my development. Maybe it's a rail trailhead. It allows them to create some uh, parking that the public can be used towards parking minimums. We currently don't allow any parking minimums for on-street parking. So if you have on-street parking, you don't get any credit for that. This will allow a developer to create some parking with the select board approval that could be used towards minimum parking minimums if it's, if it's truly public. Comments? It's kind of what we just did. It's making kind of legal what we just did with the uh, parking lot across the street, in a nutshell. Uh, yes? That, that lot would still be the responsibility of the developer to maintain while wow, it's that right? Uh, if, it's, if it's actually in public, the select board could work that out. You can work that out any way you wanted to, but in theory, it's in a public lot. 
it's probably going to be public maintaining it. I mean, the town, the town is already maintaining private lots in the downtown for certain property owners. So, mm -hmm. in theory, George, I think it actually would be most likely this would be town plowing it, town paving it, it's going to be public parking. So it's probably what, fair. Is this what we had done down at the park and ride? Uh, this is more talking about what we did kind of at the the Copley Municipal Parking Lot across the street, where we redesigned it, restriped it with a developer to create more off street parking and so they could count it towards the minimums. That parking didn't Understood. exist yet. If you look at the zoning, you really couldn't quite count that parking the way the DRB looked at it, but the parking is being created with the select board and the developer working independently, and this basically allows that pathway to exist. Okay. It's a good pathway, it's a nice change. Uh, any questions on that one? Okay. Go ahead, Bob. Tracy, Bob. I may be off base here, but to me, it seems like the taxpayers are being asked to again pick up development costs. Um, where are impact fees in all this? Hmm. I, you know, I guess I don't quite understand. You know, all these little, seemingly little things add up over a period of time to impact taxpayers in the town. And I just wonder, uh, this just to me seems like another one. Now, maybe I'm off base here. If I am, I apologize, but I just felt that I needed to say that. So Todd, is it fair to say that this would allow the select board to do this, but it would not require the select board? Correct. Okay. Uh, and the select board, using the example of across the street, the select board did share the cost of that with the developer. So the developer paid a third of it, maybe half of it. I don't quite remember what the percentage was. Okay. So there is some skin in the game by the developer. Correct, yes. And but, you just have to trust your select board at the time to cut a good deal for the taxpayers. But they do not pay for any plowing or any additional services in that respect, correct? It depends on what deal the select board makes. I mean, yes, if it's a public parking lot, I mean, I think you're going to be plowing it. I mean, select board plows Union Bank and Bourne's, that's on a public parking lot, and you get paid a little bit for it, but you can plow that and maintain that as well and pave it and stripe it. So it depends on whatever deal you guys make. It just creates the pathway. If the select board wants to make a deal to help a development, which happened a couple of years ago, to create needed parking, it makes it legal. Okay. Other comments on 451? Go ahead. Section 452 simply speaks to when paving is required, when it's not required. The Homes Act changed parking requirements. We can only we can only require one parking space per dwelling unit. So even in a development, I'll use an example. I have a uh, an eight unit, three bedroom each development. So 24 bedrooms being developed in town right now. As a town, thanks to the Homes Act, we can only require eight parking spaces. Even though there's 24 bedrooms, eight's the most we can require under law. And this is detailing what's paid, what's not paid as a result of those Homes Act changes. And it's, uh, what the helpful part here is the changes were parked for pavement versus not are being tied to zones, which everyone can look at a map and see. Right now it's town to village, tied to village and town lines. I'm one of the eight people in the town who can probably tell you where all the village lines are, where the town lines stop. Most people have no idea where village and town lines are. So instead of doing parking by what's in the village, what's in the town, we're doing what's in what zone, which makes a lot more sense, a lot more clear to the average customer saying, do I have to do parking or not here? Or developer, if it's what zone am I in? It's really versus I'm in the village or not. A lot of people don't know the answer to that. Any questions on the parking one? Okay, 455. Um, we, our driveway setback is uniform, 75 feet in town everywhere right now, which doesn't make a lot of sense for a village setting versus a town setting. So for the first time, the planning council is taking traffic speed into account for determining a setback. If you're in a village setting and you're on a slow moving street, you can have a smaller setback from a driveway to an intersection. If you're on a town road that's faster, it's a larger setback. So, uh, which is the way we should be doing it. It's on the, it's on the posted speed limit. Any questions on that one? Uh, the next one, 456. For generations, we've been doing an access permit process for new driveways. That access permit process is actually not very limiting by laws. So we're codifying for the first time with the zoning update. It's basically saying, doing exactly what we're doing. The, uh, you want to put a new driveway into a town road requires a permit. The highway superintendent goes out, looks at the driveway, says, I want it flat, I want better sight distance, I want a culvert, I don't want a culvert. And I, in the permit office, process that permit. Doing it for generations, but it's actually not codified in the zoning bylaws. This codifies that for the first time. 
Any questions on that one? So it's handing out the procedures, we're just actually putting it on paper for the first time. Uh, so section, we're going to go to section uh, 454. Oh, sorry, so section 450, 484. Uh, delete qualifying statement about new gas stations. Uh, there's, a, there's a rule in our zoning that talks about uh, if a new gas station is proposed, we don't allow gas stations, haven't for many years now. So we're just taking out the qualifying statement. If a new gas station is proposed, we're striking that and basically saying, leaving it as is. So uh, our zoning right now doesn't acknowledge the fact that we don't allow new gas stations. And we're just acknowledging that by taking out that first little preamble, like if a new gas station proposed, because we can't propose a new one, but we still keep the requirements for gas stations for ones remodeled, but there's no new ones going to be proposed, unless we change the zoning to allow gas stations again. So that's a pretty straightforward, that's more housekeeping in my opinion. Uh, section four, any questions on gas stations, 44? 490.5, uh, allowing uploading of architectural elements. This is kind of my pet project. So if you're uh, one of the contributing commercial buildings in our downtown, you have really cool architectural features like cornice lines, corbels, uh, the Morrisville ears on buildings, and this allows them to be illuminated. And sometimes the easiest way to illuminate something is uplighting. Normally we're very dark sky compliant, which means we don't want uplighting, but there are about 17 to 20 buildings in the town where we're, going to sit, we're saying that, provided you're not spilling light on adjacent properties, you can uplight these architectural elements to provide visual interest and really celebrate the cool architecture we have now. That's what this does. Whether there are any takers on that, or I can convince anyone to install any lighting on these architectural elements, it's a different story. We're just allowing it so I can actually pitch the idea to, to property owners. Any questions? Okay. Uh, section 635, um, the DRB has certain uh, mitigation tools for new development that are now illegal by the Homes Act, requiring rider roads, requiring bigger lots, requiring less density. We can no longer do any of those things. The DRB is being stripped of a lot of its powers by the Home Act, and this section complies with the new law. Pretty straightforward. There's no very black and white. Any questions on that one? Uh, section 641, the, the changing of the appeal party person from the secretary to the chair. Uh, this allows people not to chase Gary Nolan at his house if they want to appeal something. They submit an appeal in the town offices, which makes a lot more sense. <laughs> and Gary appreciates this change. Uh, section 710.2, we're actually going back to where we used to have it a couple years ago. Uh, minor versus major subdivisions with three lots and two lots. Uh, we changed it to uh, any Anything more than uh, one new lot was a major subdivision. And for anyone who sees my emails from about weekly, I just approve subdivisions after subdivisions after subdivisions now because developers are doing one lot at a time. Um, it didn't discourage developers from doing any subdivisions, it just actually doubled my workload. So we're actually going back to the existing rules saying that probably wasn't the uh, best way to address what we're trying to do, and we'll go back to the existing way so we're not overloading staff. Because I'm doing nothing but approving subdivisions last year. It's amazing how many subdivisions I've done. Uh, let's see, any questions on subdivisions? Uh, sec section 770 is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a listers request. We're getting net and gross acreages when lots of survey to the center line of a public road so they don't have to do the math to back up the area. Uh, basically, if you have a lot and your center line's to the middle of the road, on a town road, you don't get credit for the zoning, so you don't get taxed on it, so we give you the net acreage. It's a private road, you do get taxed on it, so the acreage is included in your lot. So we're making sure if a surveyor is showing a survey to the center line that they give us both measurements so we don't have to figure it out ourselves. That's what the surveyor should do for us. Other than that, we're going to definition. Any questions on that one? That's pretty straightforward. Section 770 is, uh, uh, is the, uh, we just talked about, sorry, after that we're going to definitions. We talked about building height, accessory dwelling unit. Most of these changes are brought on by the Homes Act. Homes Act changed, developed, changed the definition for Serve by municipal water and sewer, change the definition for single family home, two family home, multi family home. We're matching the Homes Act. Uh, the zoning bylaws, which you might get a question or two on. Any questions on the definition section? The zoning bylaws, the zones themselves. <laughs> on the zones themselves at the end, the last part of this, again, we talked about we're eliminating the medium density residential zone. It's really just being combined in with a low density residential zone. You're not losing that density. Uh, one of the big changes we're doing, if you look at the zoning map on the wall versus zoning map in your packet, our zoning map has shrunk greatly. We've shrunk our low density residential areas by, by, uh, by pretty large swaths, including our source service management area. So look at the map in your package here. 
We've tried, I've worked with the village, uh, Kevin Newton, the village, to try to determine we're only allowing village zoning where they can get around these sewer too. So if they're applying a pump station to get sewer there, the village isn't allowing pump stations. We're not allowing the underlying zoning in the first place. So this part of Park Street, basically after the Persico's house, or starting at the edge of the Persico's house, falls out of this, falls out of village zoning, goes to rural residential agricultural. Uh, up here, part past the Mars Road, some of this, these low density residential becomes rural residential. Pretty much everything down here, all the way from Meadow Drive up here, this part of like Beacon Hill, a good huge chunks of this other than right down to Rock Art and the empty field next to Rock Art, all of this comes out of village zoning, goes to rural residential agricultural, as does uh, the industrial lot next to across the rail trail from Lost Nation, if you're looking across the rail trail, that comes out of industrial, we can't get sewer to it. Uh, and the only small expansion of the SSMA uh, where we can get sewer to is just went up to the town line here because this is all gravity. So Red Pine Estates, Skyview Acres, this little white section here, it's all gravity, can all be gravity fed. So we deleted a good chunk of our zoning and a good chunk of our source service manager and added a very small amount here. That's what these changes amount to. Basically, must say where can I grab the sewer to? Where I can't grab the sewer, if we can't get gravity sewer there, they're no longer zoned for development. Julia. So, um, Could you get the microphone, please? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Julia Companion. So in your description on the map, you were just identifying areas that I think of as close proximity or immediate village. And you're saying you're doing away with their current status and rolling them into RRA, but RRA is going up to three acres if this passes. So those immediate areas up by DeMars Road and Pinewood Estates and Lost Nation, all of those are going to increase and have less density, even though they're right in the immediate proximity of the village. They may not have water or sewer, but you're just cutting people off at the knees. Thank you. Just to add some context to that, one of the things that does, without the zoning change, we were wide open to developers determining whatever they're going to build here. We didn't have a lot of control over it. So say, for example, if we're in the source service management area and we're down in an area with single family homes, there are two acre lots. A developer, before the zoning change was warned on May 23rd, could have come in and built, extended the sewer line and built fourplexes everywhere. So every lot was a four unit apartment building. This zoning change closed that loophole. It closed the S100 loophole for now. Uh, unless the select board trustees don't approve it, that loophole is closed with this zoning update. Uh, we'll have to respond to the legislature again if they uh, make further land use changes or land use zoning preemptions, which they may do. I heard the governor was on the ride today. So that will make some changes as well. But for right now, um, Julia's right. This does take chunks of land away from village zoning and creates a rural residential agriculture, but we're working with the trustees and trying to really zone things for development where we can get sewer lines too. The, the village trustees aren't taking on pump stations. So we don't want to falsely advertise that, hey, develop here, when in reality, you're not going to get sewer there anyway because the trustees aren't going to approve your pump station. And most developers will never take on a privately held pump station because they're expensive and they're hard to maintain and they're paying the backside. And that's the zoning change in the, in the, uh, in the whole. Any other questions or? You got one behind you. So the, uh, in the LDR zone, is it Taz is still going to allow for the uh, class B, class zero, class two, class three development without municipal connections? It still does, yes. So the so the LDR zoning it has three classes, right? So class one is water and sewer connections to municipal systems, and class two is, is one or the other, and class three is none. So they have different uh, square footage acreage requirements for those developments. So what it seems like is happening is they're correlating LDR directly to the sewer service area. However, historically, the LDR has included the opportunity for you to develop without connecting to water or sewer. Uh, if you're non-proximity to it, and it doesn't make sense to connect to it. So therefore, you can have uh, more dense development in LDR and not have water and sewer connections. You just have to have slightly larger lots. For example, if you don't have water or sewer, the current rules is 25,000 square foot per lot, right? That's a half acre, as opposed to being put into the RRA, which currently is almost two acres, right? Which is they're proposing it to be three acres. Um, so 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, the direct correlation of LDR being sewer service only, I don't, I don't think was the original intent of it. And to, to Julia's point, it, it's taking away the ability to do more dense development in village areas that look and feel like village areas simply because there's not a sewer service uh, at the front at the front step. So I think it's worth considering not doing these restrictions because you are going to take away a lot of available density in the village setting. Uh, those people just have to do that development with on-site water supply and on-site wastewater disposal systems, which is something that's done very often. Uh, that's what was just completed down in Beacon Hill, up to Beacon Hill, where you have more dense units. It's in the village, but it's not on water and the village water and sewer. Also, Todd, could you explain again the, how the 8,000 square foot maximum works? Because I'm not sure how that's going to correlate to class two and class three development LDR that require 15,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet. It's only uh, 8,000 square foot maximum if you're on class one development. So if you get to village water and sewer and, and the maximum uh, a lot size of 8,000 square feet applies. So if you can still develop on class two and class three, you know, 10,000 square foot lot or 25,000 square foot lot with no village services, but the maximum is where there's village water and sewer. We have to do that to comply with the state. The state says they want five units per acre, and that's why there's an 8,000 square foot maximum lot size. It's 40,000 square feet divided by units five, so that's why you're 5,000 square feet. The problem there is that, so you're saying, you're saying you can do class three development at 25,000 square feet, but that's if you have on-site water and sewer. In such case, the five units per acre doesn't apply. So right. the five units per acre, which is the state law, is only for water, municipal water and sewer connections. So that wouldn't apply anyways. I guess what I'm getting at is that the, the, the way the rules are written here and presented, it seems a little confusing about how we can still allow for density, for, still allow for LDR development when it's not on water and sewer. So this is essentially kind of a workaround to not allow any, any construction or any development in LDR unless it is on water and sewer and is only a maximum of 8,000 square foot per lot. And I, I think that's a big move, it's a huge move. And whether I'm not, I don't know if I'm really for it or against it, I just think it's a significant change. And there has been a lot of village development that utilizes sections of LDR that are not uh, on water and sewer. Thank you, Tyler. Other comments, questions? Go ahead. Introduce yourself, Pat. Uh, Patrick Persico, uh, 784 Park Street. And I have 15.7 uh, acres. And uh, so there's a back meadow, which is a really nice meadow back there. And uh, like that would hurt really well up there. And if I'm right, I'm being held back on that top because of the, the sewer. They, they included you in the split, so right now you're okay. All as for the zoning is, is you're okay. So that can be. It would have been held back. But well, that's back to the way it was. Correct. Yes, so they could have been 88 units. Correct. Yeah, try and have a conversation with the board if you can, <laughs> with us. But okay. yeah. So it, it's just the way it changed, and but I guess it's not changing. But yes, it is. <laughs> Back, do me a favor, do the history. You and Tyler had a back and forth. Do the history of what it was, what you were asking for, what didn't. So, so I can understand. So we've been there 47 years and I've gone through a lot of zoning changes. So uh, being that it's time for the Persico family to move on. And so uh, we were getting ready to put the property on the market. And uh, we were being told that it originally could have been 88 units on the property. And so now that changed. So I had to push real hard to get my, my four lots on the front pasture. It had to be done um, by May 23rd, which I've got done. And uh, so, and, but we haven't got to the, the park up back. So it's been very confusing. And uh, I think I was a little bit blindsided by it. And 
I think I pride myself on the fact that I pay attention to these, and I didn't see it coming down. And you know, I, I don't know how I missed it, but I'm moving forward. But, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. So close to comments, not relation to Pat. Uh, one of the important things that I didn't relate regarding the maximum lot size in the village. Let's say you bought a house in Fairwood Parkway, you bought a house on Jersey Way, you bought a single family home surrounded by single family homes, but you have to be in the village, you have to be served by village water and sewer. What the Homes Act says is you're now, it could be a fourplex, your neighbors can be fourplexes, so basically you're all apartment buildings. And let's say if you're halfway through your mortgage and you bought a single family home in a single family neighborhood, I, I think you should have some entitlement to that, and I think the Planning Council agreed too which is why we try to write the zoning to protect these neighborhoods from getting turned into apartment developments just because it's water and sewer. So this is a property owner. Uh, this does allow growth, this zoning change, and it allows growth in small lots on your smaller homes and affordable houses in the village. Uh, and that's the intent here, but the intent is also to, to, to protect these single family neighborhoods. There's a social kind of construct there, a compact. You're halfway through your mortgage, you bought a single family home. You didn't buy a single family home paid in all these years to watch everything around you can turn into apartment buildings because of the decree by the legislature. So we're trying to protect these homeowners and the investment in these properties via these zoning changes. So that's a really important part here. Mm -hmm. When you talk about lot size, this or that, we're trying to protect property owners from uh, having the neighborhood turn into apartment buildings, which we're really trying not to do. And even for Pat's point, yes, Pat, because the sewer line ends at the, uh, at the school, doesn't go down Park Street. Pat could have done 88 homes under the old zoning, but if we had done 88 homes on Park Street, people would have cried bloody murder down there. And Pat's done four homes in the subdivision for a few more up the hill. What he's done actually works pretty well. And that's partly with the new zoning and the planning council worked with Pat to accommodate him. So I think we found a good middle ground to direct development to the village, protect the people who invested in our village and still see our town grow. That's the, that's the nutshell here. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Other questions, comments? before we close the hearing. Anybody on Zoom have any questions? Okay, well, I thank you very much for coming. You're welcome to stay. We're gonna continue the meeting. Um, and thank you very much for all your comments and, and questions. I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. So I have a motion to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Laura. So I have a motion by Chris, second by Laura. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I am, it is 627, and I am gonna call the select board meeting to order for Monday, June 17th. Changes or additions to the agenda? No changes. We have minutes from June 3rd. Um, I'll make a motion to accept them, but I think there's two corrections. Okay, so I have a motion uh, to accept the minutes from June 3rd with two corrections coming. Do I have a second? Thank you, Laura. I'm going to wait for Laura. Sure. So Laura, I don't know if you caught all that. I got a motion from Chris to accept the minutes with two corrections and a second by George. Chris, I assume you'd like to tell us your corrections. Yeah, uh, if my memory serves me correct, uh, number seven uh, under new business. Uh, I, when I made the motion, I thought that I made the motion to have the uh, town manager signed a contract with the Royal County Sheriff's Department. Um, I remember it that way. Richard seemed to remember it that way. Um, as I made the point that contracts were under the purview of the, of the town manager. Was that contract signed? Did I sign it? I have to look back at Yeah. Yeah, I don't recall either. I do too. Yeah. And then the, um, the second change is um, coming out of executive session. Um, it allows uh, Don to sign on behalf 
of the uh, board and you had recused yourself. So the motion was to have the vice chair sign. Yeah, I do, I do remember that. Yes. So Thank those you. Those would be the two corrections that I saw. Any other discussion regarding the minutes from June 3rd? After executive session. Yeah, we had already come out at that point. Okay. And there's supposed to be a signature in some place? Yeah. There was an agreement. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the board in the motion it was to have the vice chair sign. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Any further discussion? So all those in favor of the motion as presented with those two changes? Aye. Say aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. Thank you, Judy. Um, okay, under new business, we have we presently have a vacant lister position and we have uh, Grant Wheeler who we've already met tonight and he has put in a um, request to be on the board of real or to be on the uh, Morristown to be a Morristown lister. I nearly said board of realtors. You're already there. Uh, I know I read his uh, his application. He seems uh, quite qualified, and I think we have a an ex lister that is willing to support him as well. I I will say just before uh, I'm assuming we're going to get a motion here in a second. I just want to be clear that what we are doing is appointing what we would do if the motion is presented and passed is uh, appoint you as a lister, but at the very next local election, you would need to uh, to run as a lister and you would need to be voted in as a as a lister by the voters of Morristown. Yes, that's correct. It's my understanding it's a public appointed position, but there being a vacancy, you have the power to appoint uh, someone. So I, I did submit an application. I've been in real estate for the last 10 years reading listers cards. Um, and to my comment earlier about Select Board Planning Council, it's been on my radar, but uh, with, with twin three-year-olds, I haven't quite had the bandwidth to show up on a weekly basis. I do appreciate all the work you guys put in. Um, and actually, you know, Sarah approached me about the uh, vacant position. Um, it sounded like something that I, I would have the capa capacity for, um, and I'm interested in, in serving in that regard. Um, and to be fully transparent, there's also a little bit of self-interest in there as well, uh, being in the profession that I'm, that I'm in. Um, so therefore, I'm committed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Sarah, you very much, Grant. clarification, the next um, election is <laughs> August. We don't the know. Moment, the next local election is March of 2024. Right. Town meeting. Oh, local. Oh, yes. okay. uh, yeah, 2025. Yeah. Um, the primary stuff. Okay. You or the public petitions for a special election before next town meeting, it would be then. Um, Grant got some write-ins, so I had mentioned it to him when he was here in the office. You got some write-ins for listeners um, uh, at town meeting, and there's an open seat. That but at that time, didn't get the 25 that he needed. No. Yeah, right. So yeah, so just to be clear, the August election is a uh, state primary and that does not count as a local election. So, but. Even if we have other uh, local yeah. amendments on it? So if you decide to hold a local, a special election at the August primary that same date, then it would be on the town ballot. It wouldn't be on the state ballot. Right. Yeah. As it stands now. But as it's not at, at the election. moment, there's no special election warned for the town for August. Thank but you. if you choose to warn one for August, that would need to be an article on it. Okay. Thank you. You ready for a motion? I am ready for a motion. I would move to appoint Mr. Grant Wheeler to fill the vacant Mr. Position until the next local election. So I have a motion by Chris. Second. I have a second by Richard. Any further discussion? All those in favor of appointing Mr. Grant Wheeler to the lister position, say aye. 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 That would be unanimous. Judy, thank you. Next up, appoint a fire warden. Um, Denny, our chief of, uh, our fire chief, Denny D. Gre uh, Greg Gregorio, 
Uh, Dean, Dean yeah, I knew I had that prompt from the beginning. I'm just going to say Denny um, has been the fire warden for a long time. I know I've been calling him up for permits for, for what seems like a long time. Uh, so we need to appoint uh, appoints him, if you so choose, for a five-year term starting the 15th of June. Well, I would move to approve Dennis DiGregorio to be appointed as town Morristown Forest Fire Warden for a term starting June 15th, 2024 to June 30th, 2029. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Chris, a second by Richard to appoint Denny, Denny for the next five years as our town fire warden. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Aye. 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 That would be unanimous as well, Judy. Uh, next, uh, Soulmate Brewery has a request for an ADA access. Um, so Soulmate is looking to put some tables behind the business and also build a ramp is my understanding and they have uh, they've made these requests we have talked to our town lawyer and what we would like to what the suggestion from administration is to uh, offer a license to the owner Jonathan Moger thank you Jonathan did I pronounce that right I, I my pronunciations have not if you want to step up to the microphone. It's a combination of the ramp coming out from the building and then putting, because if you serve alcohol, you have to have a barrier for the state, you know, no alcohol beyond this point. So I want to do like a nice decorative wall around there. So it'd be low, so you can see, you know, Elmore Mountain. So it'd be a combination of that. So to lease or license or whatever it is that, those little triangles that are kind of, yeah. I, I put it on the map so it doesn't take up much space, but have the access to that to do that would be great i agree it didn't look like it was taking up a lot of space and i had yeah. walked back there a couple of times and looked at it and yeah and this would not encroach on the parking spots the parking no, the parking lot nine feet of space between where the white lines are and where we put the, the barrier uh, which would be nice like we can hang flowers on it we'd work with mac on that you know to make sure everything is great and then you'd have five feet of space between the white lines at the the other end so plenty of space to get through sounds to me like a great way to support one of our local businesses that's helped to spruce up downtown appreciate yeah. that yeah thank Jonathan, you. i have a question for you yes sir um the barrier that you're talking about since the outdoor seating is seasonal mm -hmm. um, that barrier would be able to be removed for winter time so that in terms of snow removal and, and such it wouldn't impact anything for snow removal anyway because that's all overnight parking so the plows don't even get in there so we would be shoveling. Um, so, so your, your we, intention is to leave it in place. Is that what you're saying? Ideally, because I want to talk with Sean about what we can. I mean, I, what I'd like to build would be something that potentially has some overhead to give you a little bit of shade versus having uh, umbrellas. But we can go with umbrellas. So I'd just like to chat, you know, with the fire marshal on if he would give us the okay to do something like that within that seating area. Because if you all remember from the corner pocket that had that whole covered area, but when we had to put the propane tank underground to feed our boiler, Sean said, hey, you can't have a roof there anymore because attached to the building because it has to be back so many feet from the gas. So it'd be kind of nice to put some type of covering over there that's not attached to the building. But if we can do it, it'd be great. If not, then we won't. You know. We've got a planning. Uh, uh, Chris, to answer your question, I went over there with the highway superintendent. The area where the CD is proposed doesn't propose an impediment, uh, an impediment to uh, snow pushing or snow merging anyway, so it's out of the way. So no issue you can be built in winter. It's not going to bother you. It conforms to all your zoning. Correct. Yes. Okay. That's what, that was my question. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, but, sorry but, in, but I didn't. No. I, had one off the last yeah, one. I, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. The, Currently, and for all your past businesses, there's been an ADA X access in the front. I walked over there today. So you have one. You can't get to the back. We're entrance from the parking lot to there. It's two separate lounges. They're not attached to the front. So are you running street. two different businesses? Nope. It's one business, just two different tasting rooms. Oh, I didn't know that. And so you have, but you also have a patio up front and you've received permits 
to extend on the sidewalk. So you're basically asking for two separate the patio, the patio, patios the patio out front is our property. We didn't ask for permission to do that. We actually still have six inches from where I put that patio board. Right, but didn't you get some permits for uh, when the September fest to fall out into the street? Oh, right. October, okay. October fest? Yeah, that's a one day thing. Yeah, that's sure. what I'm saying. So you have access to extend at certain points. Yes, I mean, that's just the, like I said, the one day event. So my other question actually is kind of for Todd, and this has been, I was on the DRB when this parking lot, uh, the revisions were in. This is not the lot that we approved. I've had questions. I've also had lots of complaints that it's not the lot uh, and that my understanding is it does not fit the, the current zoning um, with the big yellow things. There's no trees. So I have huge concerns um, in that we have other businesses already discussing the parking lot and personally having, you know, I have um, real concerns over sprawl where businesses all of a sudden start sprawling. Um, and this is a Copley for, you know, designed for public uh, use. So, I think I just think it's an issue if we start licensing or allowing sprawl to go out into this public facility. And I would first of all like to see the parking lot assured that it is in zoning and that the other businesses currently um, who have made complaints that we address their issues before we start allowing additional development on the parking lot. If I if I may just uh, comment before. Uh, this was recommended. Um, Todd and I walked the parking lot. He explained to me the, the original design and uh, the current design. Uh, that was one of the questions I brought up is if we establish this precedent for one business, will we be, will we be at risk for uh, precedent for, for other businesses that might impact the parking spaces, walkways? Um, you know, I won't speak for Todd, but uh, he indicated that uh, it's not impacting parking spaces. It wouldn't even be impacting walking spaces because it's so few feet. Um, there were other discussions about other potential uh, reasons for licensing, and um, we we discussed those. And we had more of the concerns that you're bringing up about other businesses being impacted. So, um, Todd, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So Todd said he's doing great for those of you online. Um, so we did look at these issues and with a minimal uh, extension license that we're providing with a two year term, uh, we did take into consideration, you know, sprawl, so to speak, trying to, trying to avoid that and definitely trying to prohibit any sort of uh, precedent that would allow other businesses to go beyond um, common sense extensions. So I, I just want to let you know that those things were considered. Um, and Todd and I conferred with one, other, one another and also Kevin from the Department of Public Works. I think you're, you're asking a great question, Laura. And I, I, I think probably all of us, certainly myself, who's <clears throat> thought about this, have thought about the precedent issue. And this is clearly one of the reasons I'm very glad we're not at least not yet, and hopefully not tonight, uh, thinking about granting an easement, which would be permanent. The, the nice thing about the license is it's, it's almost like a two-year experiment. It is a two-year experiment because Soulmate would need to come back in two years and renew that license and see, see where it goes. Um, in, in my opinion, it, unless I'm missing something, it doesn't seem to impact the parking lot. It doesn't seem to impact the spaces. And it does, it, it does offer us a chance to take a part of the town. And, you know, we've got a business owner here that's willing to perhaps improve that area. Um, I mean, those are the positives. I'm not taking away from what you're saying, because you're I, asking very good questions. And, I, and I just, you're right, the I crescent just is an issue. This has come up when the when the rebuild was done for those who don't remember it was a 
huge issue. Uh, it was just brought up again tonight that we're, the town is now plowing this, even though it's parking for another place. So that was an interesting uh, comment. The, you know, there's the, the redesign that happened somewhere along the line, there's a huge vacant space. And I, you know, I, I just have issues with the fact that it was redesigned and ultimately it I, to me it just seems um, the you know if there were no ADA or there was no uh, deck but there is one in front so you can't access the back part of the building well you have one so you and the fact that it. this is um, this is public land I I I think and having been on the DRB once you make an exception it becomes precedent and it makes the drb's job a nightmare so um, i have huge concerns that uh, about that and that's my opinion so there you go other comments mr brewster come on up James Brewster, um, if I heard correct, this is a sort of a two-year test trial run. Two-year license. Two-year license. I'd just like to say, let's make sure we get this into somebody's calendar, because we did a test, we did a trial run with four wheelers on somebody's, our town roads, and it just got forgotten, right? And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, we've been doing it forever, so we just, let's keep it. So let's make sure that if it is for a limited time, it gets into somebody's calendar, not just the business owners, but somewhere in the town that says, this thing is up, let's go back and check. Thank you, Jamie. And to go back to Chris's comment about the, the barrier, if it is a two year license, and there's, you mentioned a proposal about having some sort of roof structure, what's the permanency of that if it's only a two year license? It's, it's all bolts. Well, I'm looking for the will of the board. Um, I'll make a motion to approve a two-year license for the six uh, feet wide by 24 feet long hand-drawn triangular area on January 12, 2024 as built plans for the Copley Municipal Parking Lot. So management properties LLC doing business as Solney Brewing for the purposes of outdoor dining and handicap ramp access. Two-year license is renewable upon select board reapproval. The license shall not be transferable to another business without prior Morristown select board approval. I have a motion by Chris. Do I have a second? I have a second by George. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. And the board, uh, the chair voted in favor as well. So that'd be four to one. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for that conversation. I, I, I must agree it's, it's not black and white. I, I, you give it out your email address. Let me just take it. <laughs> Next, uh, Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control. So I could use a motion to, re to recess the select board meeting and open as the Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control. I have a motion to recess select board. Do I have a second? I have a second by George, a motion by Chris. All those in favor of recessing? Aye. 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 That would be unanimous. So there is a liquor license renewal for Dollar General uh, for a second class license. I checked with Jason and he has no concerns over that renewal. I would move to approve the liquor license application as presented. I'll second. I have a motion by Chris, a second by Richard. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented, say aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. And then there's a request to cater permit from Vermont Hard Cider Company, LLC. It's a woodchuck sampling at Morrisville Beverage. 
on June 27th from 4 to 7. Also, Jason didn't have any concerns with that. Okay. And this is a special event, correct? This is a special event. Okay. I'm, I'm get, um, at MoBev, um, at Tomlinson's, it's a school people in town call. Um, I'm guessing you're not old. That, uh, I'm guessing that they're just their company is going to have samples there. Okay. Tasting, yeah, yeah, tasting. Do I have a motion? I would move to approve uh, a special event for an Second. I'll second. A motion by Chris, second by Laura. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion as presented, say aye. 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 That would be unanimous. I'll move to adjourn the Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control meeting. I'll I'm sorry. That's okay. I have a motion by Chris and a second by Laura to adjourn Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that I'll would, move to reconvene the select board meeting. That was unanimous, that pet last motion. I have a motion to reconvene. Do I have a second? A second by George. Discussion? All those in favor of reconvening the select board meeting, say aye. 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 That would be unanimous, Judy. Uh, next under new business, number five, to approve the 2024-2025 tax anticipation note. Sarah? So this is um, the tax anticipation note is something that we do every year. Um, we The select board voted uh, a couple years ago to make the union bank our sole source provider because the interest rates that they could provide for um, the tax anticipation note, no other banks could match. Um, and it just um, was kind of a waste of their time because that they were not comparable at all. Um, so I don't need you to vote on um, whether or not you want the Union Bank. That's who we go with. Um, what we do is Tina does um, figures out the expenses um, for the year um, and the income for the year on a monthly basis and finds the month, it's typically in September, where we have the most deficit in our cash flow. Um, it's right before taxes come in, and then we're allowed to borrow 5% above that estimated um, deficit. And uh, the Union Bank offers two options. One is a tax anticipation loan with a reinvestment option. So that means um, that the, the money that we borrow is put in a high interest bearing account and we earn money on it. Um, and what the union bank does that the other um, banks do not do is any money that sits in that bank account we earn interest on so we um, keep all of our um, unallocated funds in that so we're also earning that high interest rate um, option two would be a simple line of credit um, that would cost us interest so with going um, with option one the anticipated revenue would be $33,173. In option two, the uh, anticipated expense would be 36, there should be a comma, $1,066. My recommendation would be to go with option one where you're gonna make money instead of option two where you will lose money. And just to be clear, that first option is to make 33473 or? Yes. Okay. Um, well, my mind making money versus losing money makes yeah, a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I would move to approve option one, the tax anticipation loan with a reinvestment option from the Union Bank for a total loan amount of $3,315, a loan rate of 4.65% and a reinvestment rate of 5.1% for fiscal year 2025. I have a motion by Chris, second, second by George. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. So the Union Bank will send you a DocuSign to um, fill out. Okay. Okay, great. So that'll need to be done electronically? Yes. Okay. So there was the one for the bridge, the Walton Bridge. If you hadn't signed that one, please sign that one um, from your last meeting. Then there will be this tax anticipation note. So you should sign two in total. 
And just to confirm that the last one I signed, even though my name was spelled wrong, is still good, right? Mm -hmm. I, I confirm with the union back. Okay, yeah, something came through and I was like, do I need to be signed? Thank you. Does that DocuSign need to be signed tomorrow? Um, the the Walton Bridge one needed. No, the one um, in for the anticipation. No, of. not necessarily tomorrow. We don't get the money until July first. So if. Because unless I get it first thing in the morning, I'm not going to be able to sign for a couple of days. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's true. I do right. need you to sign that. I need you to sign the Walton Bridge one. Okay. Sign that one because we wanted the money today. Okay. I can do that. So that DocuSign has not been signed yet? Um, the one for the Walton Bridge, Don still hasn't signed it. Okay. Um, and then once he does, then we can get the money for the Walton Bridge. So just for okay. clarification, we all have to sign. Otherwise, it's it's not a quorum on this. Because um, I, I try to go, once you guys sign, then it comes to me. Okay. And then I sign it and I check today. I can't sign it because you haven't signed, I'll sign it. So we, okay, because George brought up the quorum question. So it's a good point. Yeah, because on yeah. paper, it's it's a quorum. So Sarah, the, the Union Bank tried to send us the DocuSign before we had an opportunity to actually vote on it tonight. So I deleted that email. Um, I'm assuming they're going to send a redo yes. for all of us to sign. Yes. Okay. So they signed, they were confused with the salt sole right. source. They sent right. it ahead of time. Um, and then when I told them it hadn't been reproved, they retracted it. Right. Um, and they'll send a new one. Right. Great, I can sign that Walton Bridge thing tonight. Okay. So uh, next, number six, to approve the financing for the ambulance and the power stretcher. So the voters authorized this at town meeting this year? Um, town this, meeting, I'm getting confused. Was this this year or last year? <laughs> yeah, I think it was, it was last, last year. year. It was a lot of bits all at once. Yes, yeah. so the voters approved this last year um, at town meeting. I put out four bids. Um, only three decided to bid on it. Um, Community National Bank came at 5.245, Union Bank 5.49%, Community Bank 5.99, all semi-annual fixed amounts, term of five years. My recommendation for this one would be to go with Community National Bank as the lowest bidder. It's been the rare situation that the Union Bank isn't the lowest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would entertain a motion. I move to accept the bid from Community National Bank for financing the purchase of an ambulance and stretcher uh, for the amount of $355,000 at a fixed semi-annual interest rate of 5.245% for a term of five years. So I have a motion by Chris. Do I have a second? Uh, second. Second by Laura. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Aye. That would be unanimous. Next, the ambulance write-off. Uh, this is something that comes up every year for the select board. These are uh, for- Uncollectibles, really. Yeah, you know, payments that we just cannot collect for one reason or another. Yes, and there's, to my understanding, been a history that the, the select board just wrote them off. Um, yeah, I do remember doing this in the past. I think it's I think it's you know, uh, fair to say that uh, we had an extensive conversation about this last year. It was the first mm -hmm. year for myself and several other members on the board. Um, Tina made it really clear that she works with individuals to try to set up payment plans and at least you know try to receive some funding on on these. Um, uh, what are now being considered uncollectibles um, and um, with no response or inability to pay um, we we run a business and businesses sometimes um, are not able to collect receivables and these are uncollectible receivables and it would cost more to try to to go to a collection agency and get pennies on the dollar uh, or nothing um, than to 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 finally just write these off. 
Brent, did you talk to Tina about this? I did. I'm just trying to, uh, in reference to what Chris was talking about, it, it seems to me that um, she broke down that some of these were workman comp cases that were never paid out and that that increased the cost of trying to recoup them. I'd have to check on that. I just, yeah, just because this has come up um, in some other conversations and I was just trying to get my information. It seems like so it wasn't just individuals. It was um, it was a little more involved than that, but. Just I, I can follow up with you. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, no. I don't have that information. Yeah, uh, just for clarification, sure. so for a future quest, because so I would, I would make the motion to approve the write off of $38,118.47 for uncollectible ambulance calls for fiscal year 2223. Okay, I have a motion by Chris. Do I have a second? I have a second by George. Comments from the board? We have someone at the microphone. Yeah, I know. Actually, if the back thing clearly states it. it says that a majority of the, of the calls are people who didn't pay have no insurance or no contact 35 paid nothing in the balance of the 28,000 so um, uh, she's she's made the clarification there so it's not working so. go ahead so, uh, Tony, Cody, Cody Hill I was wondering if these people are not paying our Morristown residents or are they hmm. around the surrounding area that's a good question. If you could share that. Uh, I don't have that information, but I can definitely look into it as long as there's no HIPAA rules that might be violated. Um, can, anything that's uh, available through public information, I can definitely share that with you. You know, because my concern has been that we provide the service, taxpayers pay for this. And, you know, at, at least they should a little bit yeah, yeah it's one one more example of where we're paying well, we're paying for the services that are yeah. central to the county we yeah it really should be a county service in my eyes but i don't know yeah. how we get there you know that's but the whole thing should be the county service yeah there's um thank you tony detail on the back i'm not sure if you guys have this uh, it says 902 calls were made in this time period. 368 calls were no transport, 40.8%. Uh, 40 and if you know about the payments, um, we don't get paid unless they transport. We get um, nothing, yeah. That's right. Uh, and you can, our legislators and senators in uh, Washington are working on that to get Medicare to cover those, but that's another story. Um, so 534 calls were billed, 84 calls needed to be written off, 15.7%. The majority of the calls are people who didn't pay, have no insurance or no contact. So, so the, the legislature did, uh, in the 11th hour, um, pass a bill that was introduced to right. look into allowing ambulance services to bill Medicaid, not Medicare. Medicare. Um, uh, to reimburse for non-transport calls. Yes. So there is movement in that piece. Which Nobody one? wants to die. Everybody wants to get sure. checked out. Yeah. Nobody so, wants to see you, Chris, at the end. It's, uh, it's, uh, it becomes a primary care. Yeah. 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 I think the challenge with this is clearly when the call goes out, the end is got to go. There's not going to be a question of do they have the other They don't ask for a credit card or no. They, they've got a role. They've got to provide their services, and this is the end result of some of this. I think it's true across the board in the medical services. Well, I, I think not everybody pays up. Yeah, I yes, think they the. Should. I hear you, Tony, and I agree with you. I think the concern is is that we have ambulance service. Our taxpayer dollars pay for what's called cost of readiness. So our tax dollars are paying for folks to sit over there to make the calls. We have been moving forward with, uh, we've done it with Elmore um, to start building, uh, building in some costs to help cover those costs of readiness. So I think that's part of what the, re the, the concern is, is that help, you know, that we potentially may be sending out an ambulance that we're not getting any money for, but with the ambulance, they are looking at that and have been addressing that. And I know Elmore, we have a 
uh, program in place with potential and you're looking at the Walcott. Uh, we serve such a minor section of Walcott, but uh, that is being looked at by the REMS. So I have a motion and I have a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as presented? Aye. 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 That would be unanimous, Judy. So under old business, flood mitigation grant, at the last meeting I, um, on June 3rd, I, I informed the board of my uh, presence at LCPC and a meeting with other towns in regards to this flood mitigation grant. There is, uh, this is federal dollars, there's $91 million coming into the state of Vermont and um, a lot of towns around the, around the state, certainly counties, uh, other planning commissions, um, are uh, scrambling right now and trying to figure out how to get a hold of this money. There's good news. Uh, the good news is the deadline of June 21st has been extended till August 16th, which is very nice. Gives everyone an extra couple of months to think about what they might want to uh, might want to apply for. And the other good news is uh, at the last meeting I informed you that there was a 25% match except for buyouts. Well, it turns out the state not, it was actually, I think the next day, it was a day or two after that meeting, the state came forward and said that there would be no match at all, that the state would cover cover the match. So we have an opportunity to get some money uh, for flood mitigation. Um, now, just this past week, I guess it was a week ago, Brent and I went to the, the latest flood mitigation meeting and um, met with several towns there's a couple of towns that were well represented morristown was well represented and we continued this conversation and uh what i would you know i did ask the board to come forth with some ideas tonight um any any additional ideas from what we presented last time but i would suggest because we have a little bit of time to breathe and we're not under the gun we don't have uh four days what we thought we had we have two months to get ready for this that we uh, continue this conversation on July 1st and give ourselves a chance to, to think about what we might be, uh, might be looking at. It is worth noting that the grant that will go in um, that LCPC is helping us with will not just be for towns in Lamoille County, but also in Orleans County. And that's because of hard work, which should make our standing in the grant application even stronger because it looks like those in charge of giving out the grant money are looking to do um, do it regionally. They're looking for a regional benefit, which of course makes all the sense in the world. The river is regional. It's not, it doesn't change when it enters one town uh, versus the, the last one that it was in. So how does this work, Don? Does it, um, because you're talking regional now, as well as including Orleans County, um, is the town of Morristown applying for specific funds uh, as part of the, the countywide ask, is that? That's correct. So the town, okay. the town needs to put in a pre-application okay. on August sixteenth. So we are the the applicant. Okay. But the idea is that other towns might be asking for similar things. That would coordinated effort. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Don, can you speak to? Um, uh, <clears throat> the pre-applicant is is the process still that we start the very vague and then we have to go to the more formal steps or is this august deadline a more formalized process the august 16th correct me where i go where you think i go wrong here um brent, brent but it's uh it is a pre-application it's a pretty simple application process yeah so we can throw out lots of ideas we're not committed to any of them and, and let's say we throw out let's say just for <clears throat> argument we throw out three ideas we would put in three free applications there'd be one for each and so they then come can come back to us and say we'll go we'll, we agree with these two and then we build out the full grant for those two that i i don't know that there, i have not been told that there's a selection process after the pre-application um and i i'll have to look into this but I, from what i understand if once you submit a pre-application you need to you need to start preparing for um, a more formalized and i i have not seen um that the state will 
will remove pre-apps necessarily. That was my understanding from uh, uh, Scott Johnstone. Okay. That, was I wrong when you guys all met? Todd, can you speak to that? The Speak to what? Well, because I thought that was very clear from Morsel Power Light. That's I could be wrong. And certainly the trustees are very interested right, in this and whole I thought my understanding from um, from Scott was that, you know, and I don't know if that would already happened or. I've been asked to help the village, yes. Okay, so the last meeting, Scott spoke to that the initial application that we we would just put in all kinds of ideas and then the state would come back and say, you know, we would be we would consider these and then we would go forward with a more formal and i would Did just I say i would just say under that thought that what we've been told is don't come in with lots of ideas come in with the narrow ideas it. yeah okay. narrow it okay. um and come in with the ideas that are are most uh, <laughs> most most pertinent to us certainly the trustees the village is very interested you know they're very interested in the pump house down there by tinny bridge they're very interested so in what's going on what's your tinny take bridge. on it todd uh, one of the things I'm Brent and I uh, talked to him about with uh, Kevin and Tina were talking about how to get flood mitigation funds to fix the Oxbow. Uh, flood zones aren't a aware thing, it's an elevation thing. So for example, if we wanted to, the top deck of the Oxbow isn't naturally there at that height. If you look, if you look at the top deck and the lower deck, it was filled at one point. Uh, the new looking at the theme is new flood maps, the parking lot is above base flood elevation. So you know when you're parking lot, you get out of the car, you step down into the park. Mm -hmm. That's the difference of rocks when you need flood permits and not any flood permits. So one of the things we talked about is uh, applying for an application to bring in fill to bring the area around the parking lot and like by the pavilion up to the parking lot height with loam and seed, loam and seed and grass it. And then for we can do away with things like fighting over swing set permits, things like that. Things that need to be anchored down and have real construction costs because we're in a flood zone. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be in a flood zone. We have a gravel pit, we have trucks, we have crews. We might be able to get some money from FEMA to run our own equipment, run our own crews to actually help take the top part, the top deck of the Oxbow out of the flood zone, which would be wonderful. So, our my understanding from Scott also was that the village was going to work with the uh, town, and that was my understanding is that we put in, you know, a, a group of ideas, and I don't mean twenty million, but but that potentially they could not say we we won't. We're not interested in that. Is that true? No, that's my understanding as well. Okay. They're really worried about, as, as Don said, their wells being undercut by the new design flow under the Tenney Bridge. As kid did that canal that kind of cuts into the well area, they're looking to help with that as well, or help flood proof the area so uh, a future well could be safer from flooding. So we, so I see what you're saying. We want to try to keep it, at, uh, but as close and get as much approved. But there is the potential that they could come back and say that's not right. something we'd be. Yep. Okay. Just yeah, and just again, you know, the, the trustees and Scott, I know Scott's been talking to Brent yeah. quite a bit. And yeah. um, so That's we're great. hoping to really put a coordinated effort in here. And it's not just the village and the town, as I said, it's working with Wolcott and working yeah. with Hardwick and working with Johnson. You know, we've been, knock on wood, we've been a little bit, is this wooden? We've been a little bit lucky, you know? Well, it was their motel that came down the yeah, river. Hardwick and Wilkett and Johnson have gotten hit really hard. And Crazy. We've kind of dodged yeah. the bullet a little bit. We've yeah. certainly been impacted. Yeah. There's no doubt there. Yeah. So are we okay then continuing this on July 1st? And I mean, do yes. people have thoughts that they wanted to share tonight? I think uh, having some more time to... That's great. This is a... Good. Um, okay, moving on. To approve the warrants. I'll make a motion to approve the warrants. Sure, we didn't ask for comments. Oh, after, after oh okay, sorry. Okay. okay. Were there were there comments on the flood grant? Were there comments on the flood grant? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, Evelyn Throne. Um, yeah, I, this is definitely one of my uh, passions and. I have been, I know not to bring up like the monster in the room, but the flooding has definitely spread the knotweed, which has certainly exacerbated the flooding because of the fact that there's not 
the kind of tree roots and all that. So I would um, I would like to ha have that stay into some kind of consideration because our whole area is being taken over by it. And the more trees that get planted and the more shade, the more likely we are to do two things. The knotweed is discouraged under the shade. And it's also um, the roots that would go down would prevent some of the swift water flow, which is carrying a lot of this knotweed into areas that are, had it before they're worse, didn't have it before, it's there now. And once it's there, it's hideous. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, that's something I'd like to really consider that a holistic approach to that would be great. That's certainly one of the ideas that's under consideration. You're right, knotweed's not our friend when it comes to all these flooding events and stream bank erosion and, and so on and so forth. Okay, any other comments? Okay, moving on, approve the warrants. I made a motion to approve the warrants. I got a motion to approve the warrants. Second by Richard. Oh, any discussion? I haven't begun to look at them, so I don't know. All those in favor of approving, or, um, approving the motion as uh, presented? Aye. Say aye. I'm sorry. Aye. Opposed? I'm going to abstain because I haven't seen them. Okay. So that would be four, four yeas, zero nays, and one abstention. Community comments. Do we have any community comments? Come on up. Tom Flutie and Morris First, I'd like to say as a taxpayer and a town resident, very pleased to see what's happening in this town in the last couple of months. I've been, I can see improvements being made for the first time in a long time. I'm encouraged for the way that this town is headed. And it's greatly, greatly improved in the last two months. The only thing I guess tonight I'd like to say is that I've heard that there's been like consultants for a town plan or, a, or a, that similar that the taxpayers know nothing about. And I don't know why we don't know anything. Who, whose idea was to call this consultant in? Who's paying for it? What, what's the reason for having this consultant? Who do we ask as taxpayers these, these questions to get answers? I don't expect answers tonight, but I'd like to know who do I ask? Do I come in and talk to you, Mr. Raymond, or do, we, do I send as the, I have sent things to the select board, I'd rather not go that route. And another thing that I, I understand is that you have monthly uh, department head reports and I don't know why they can't be made public over on the, the month of what they uh, say they're going to do and then what they have done, just to keep the public informed. So, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Other community comments? Uh, Tony Cody, Cody Hill. I just want to thank Brent for his time. I, I appreciate it and uh, go forward. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. James Brewster, uh, I'm going to just tag along on what uh, Tom said there. Um, it did come to my attention that there is some sort of a consultant that's going to review the town plan and, and the town bylaws. Um, and I would recommend that as these are bylaws for the village and a town plan for the village as well, um, that the village share in the cost of this consultant. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Other comments? Sarah Haskins, town resident. So I just wanted, um, Trisha Follert is going to retire this week and I just mm. wanted, um, as a citizen of this town to thank her for everything that she's done. We're really going to miss her. Um, she's brought community to this town. Um, she's brought art. She's made it a more beautiful place 
to live and to work. And I just, as a community member, um, me, myself, and my family would like to thank her. Thank you, Sarah. I, I would echo that. Think of all the wonderful things that she's been involved in. Yeah. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, schedule. Would you like to do that or would you like me to do it? Whichever you prefer. You go right ahead. On Monday, July 24th, we have a charter committee meeting at 5.30. Monday, July 1st, we have a select board meeting at 5.30. Um, on the agenda, I made an error. Uh, Monday, July 15th is incorrect. We, we will actually have a select board town plan public hearing at 5.30 on August 19th. And finally, on July 15th, we will have a select board meeting. And uh, I made another error. That will not be starting at 545. That'll be starting at 530. So I apologize about the, the errors on this. Um, I'll continue to try to make progress. Thought maybe we were having Thank a you, coffee hour or something. <laughs> coffee 15. Coffee 15. August 19th, is the August 19th yes, yes, at 530. OK. okay. Other business? Um, I will make a motion to go in executive session because I find the premature general knowledge, public knowledge of Break. probable civil litigation to which the public body may be a party and clearly place the public body involved in a substantial disadvantage. I'll second. I have a motion by Chris. I have a yeah. second by Richard. Right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. That would be unanimous, Judy. Further move to go into executive. Folks, session. folks, if I could ask you, go ahead. I would further move to go into executive session to discuss probable litigation under provisions of Title One, Section Three Thirteen A One, the Vermont Statutes, to include Town Manager Brent Raymond and Executive Assistant Judy Alberry. I have a motion by Chris. I have a second by Richard. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion as presented? Aye. Aye. That would be unanimous. Thank you.